Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at LAM Research with David Freed, who's going to talk today about changes in DRAM. David, one of the things that's been happening in D the DRAM world is the density has been increasing, almost as if we've been following the same curve as Moore's Law, well, but they are separate, right? Yeah, it's a bit separate. Um, the same technologies that enable scaling, uh, lithography and the etch and uh, frequency multiplication, those are all scaling along and have been enabling DRAM scaling. Uh, but actually, when you talk about DRAM scaling and DRAM density, it's really bits per square millimeter or, or square micron, however you want to characterize it. Um, the complexity about talking in DRAM density is it's not just about the bit cell. You have to talk about the, the array, but also all the peripheral circuitry that's required, and scaling has led to some real challenges there. So let's dig down into this. Sure. David, what are we looking at here? Okay, if we're looking at a, an area of DRAM, you really have to take a few things into consideration. Uh, one is the array, which I put an A on, and that's really where you just have a repetitive array of DRAM bit cells. But on the sides of the array, you typically have blocks of what's called peripheral cells or peripheral logic. And really what the periphery does is it gets data into and out of the array. So um, this is a very common drawing, common analysis of DRAM. As we've been scaling the technologies and scaling patterning and the lithography and the frequency multiplication, the density of the array has gone way up. Okay? Um, so that's great, but if it doesn't scale the entire product, you lose some of that density advantage at the product level. And actually what we've been seeing is as the array density goes up, it has taken its toll on some of the performance aspects of the cell. And so typically what we're seeing is a transition to um, a very dense array, but then significantly larger periphery to account for some of those performance differences. And so if the, if the cell can't hold its state quite as well, if it's not as stable, if it has a shorter retention time, and you need to write that data back to the cell more frequently, you typically need more logic. If you have to refresh or boost that signal to get clean data out of the array, the peripheral logic gets larger. And if that happens, all of that advantage and all of that work you put into scaling the bit cell and scaling the array density, you lose a significant piece of it when you're talking about the product. And the scaling of the DRAM is not necessarily on the same exact time scale as the logic, right? So what sort of problems does that cause? Okay, so when we're talking about an integrated product like this with array and periphery, they basically have to scale essentially together because they have to scale at the bit cell pitches. But I think what you're asking is whether DRAM products are scaling at the same node to node cadence as logic and microprocessor products, for example, and they're not. They're essentially completely disconnected. DRAM scaling has accelerated significantly, so the node to node incremental changes has gotten very quick. It's nearly on a one year cadence at this point. Um, and even the node names, they don't resemble the logic node names anymore anyway. We're well aware of the problems when we scale logic. What happens when you scale DRAM? Does, do you start running into issues such as data retention? Oh, absolutely. Let's take a look at this on the board. Essentially, a single bit of DRAM is just one transistor and one capacitor. Uh, the fact that it's just one transistor and one capacitor is the genius of DRAM. It's what's made it so small, so dense, and so scalable for so many years. Uh, but to understand how scaling impacts the performance, you really just have to look at those two pieces. Um, scaling the DRAM typically involves scaling this capacitor, making it smaller in area, and to account for that smaller area, usually it's a, a taller capacitor cell. Um, this is really tricky, okay? so the Changes in area and changes in the, the height of that capacitor cell, they have, that has pretty um, serious impacts in the capacitance, but it also has serious impacts in the variability of that capacitance. Uh, 
Okay, so this is, this is the capacitor. This is really challenging to scale properly and really challenging to control. Um, again, as you scale the capacitors down and you wanna pack them more densely together, you also have to scale the transistor right here. And as you scale the transistor, that's where a lot of the same problems happen between logic and DRAM. Smaller transistors, they're often a little leakier. They're often a little harder to control. The variability is larger. And so if you have a capacitor that maybe has a little bit lower capacitance than you'd like, and you have a transistor that leaks a little bit more than you'd like, that charge can leak off that capacitor and you lose the data in the bit cell faster or earlier than you were planning to. So that's a data retention type problem in, in DRAM. It's all caused by, or it's accelerated by scaling the capacitor and scaling the transistor to fit in with it. You're talking about variation in the capacitor. There's also problems in microloading. What is that and how do they re re relate to each other? Yeah, those two topics are, are very closely related actually. Microloading is essentially a variation in the performance of some of the processes depending on the shapes and the layouts uh, of these features. So the capacitor patterning, as I said, is really, really challenging. It's very small holes uh, through very tall stacks and they're very densely packed. Uh, but one of the effects you might see is at the corner of one of these arrays that we talked about before, if I have lots of these holes piled up into a corner, one of these holes that's right in the middle of a very dense pattern of holes, this hole may etch very, very differently than this hole that's out at the corner. If they have different layout environments, they may etch differently or you may deposit films into them differently. They may uh, print lithographically differently. So there's many different processes that will behave differently even though these shapes are designed to be identical. And that variation factors into some of the final performance variation of the capacitor. So really you've got problems in terms of scaling of logic, but you have similar pro problems in terms of scaling of DRAM, right? Absolutely. The, the same types of problems, pattern dependent effects, layout effects, uh, general process variation effects, all of those hit these technologies in the same physical way, but the way they manifest in the failures, whether it's a yield failure or an electrical performance failure, they can be very different depending on the type of product. How about things like stress and uh, thermal and noise? Absolutely. Um, similar physical mechanisms that affect us in logic or, or in NAND, they'll affect DRAM as well. One of the biggest things that's happening in stress, especially with these tall stacks right now, is you're seeing distortion, distortion of the wafer, distortion even locally in the patterns. And once you have that distortion, it becomes harder and harder to overlay and align upper levels of lithography in the fabrication process. So stress is a major effect right now, and it's impacting uh, overlay, alignment, and therefore variability of the final product as well. Does it change at all when you start getting into different configurations like HBM where you're basically stacking up the DRAM? Um, I think once you get into discussions like HBM, you have all of these product effects on the individual components and then stacking them together, um, you know, they combine. They, they are additive or, uh, or com combinatorial effects once you start combining product. Uh, these, a lot of these effects that I'm talking about, uh, stress, you know, patterning variability, uh, layout dependent effects, those are really uh, extremely localized effects on individual patterns of individual chips. Will DRAM go through the same transition as something like Logic and 3D NAND? Yeah, so it's a great question. And the interesting part here is that DRAM has been 3D for a long time. The devices, the transistors in the cell, they've actually been very narrow and saddle shaped. They look like FinFETs for a very long time, long before logic converted to FinFET. And the capacitor has been tall, narrow cups through, through tall stacks of dielectric, very similar to NAND. So DRAM in some sense is already ahead in this 3D transition, has already been 3D for a long time. That being said, the density of the cells is still controlled by 2D constraints. And so it does appear that DRAM is going to go through a physical transition, probably soon, like NAND did, to get a much higher density, a much more three-dimensional density uh, structure 
um, in, in order to drive the bit cost down or the, the bit density up much, much higher than it is right now. We are getting very, very close to some two-dimensional density limi limitations in the patterning of DRAM right now. Well, this so causes a bunch of economic problems too, right? Because you think about DRAM, this is one of the most price competitive markets that's out there to the point where it's very difficult to actually get in because all the equipment that's out there is depreciated. You now need new equipment, right? Um, I think in, in this way, it'll be similar to the NAND transition where uh, 2D NAND still carried the day for, for quite some time and some generations after 3D NAND had been innovated and, and invented. But there were a couple of really key enabling technologies that allowed that transition. One of, it, one of those key enabling transition technologies was very high aspect ratio etching and deposition in very high aspect ratio features. Um, again, a lot of those key enabling technologies have already been pioneered in NAND flash. Uh, but yes, you're right. If DRAM went through a significant structural transition to a more 3D environment, it would likely drive uh, significant investment in a few of these key enabling technology elements. It's not just the equipment though, because now you have to rethink what you're doing in memory as the density increases, right? You're trying to get to certain data faster than other data. And if it's very densely packed, it's harder to reach in there and grab that data. Uh, yes, you're right. But these are problems that actually have already been out there and have been addressed. Even in two dimensions, there have been um, great advances to exactly the localization of where you store certain data uh, to reduce the time delay to get to that data from the peripheral logic. I think these are design constraints and design techniques that memory designers have already begun to attack in 2D. And yes, they'll probably get more complicated in a different structure, but I think the mindset and the techniques already exist from the 2D environment. DRAM is notoriously thermophobic. When you start getting into heat in there, it starts disrupting how the DRAM works. What happens as you increase the density the way you're talking about? Absolutely. So, so the thermal effects will typically manifest, again, as I said earlier, as variability in the capacitance and variability in the transistor behavior. Um, earlier, we were talking about sort of static variability in the way we produce those elements of the cell. Thermal is a little bit more insidious because it can be time dependent. As you access the array and you use the array longer and longer, the temperature rises and the behavior of the cell changes over time because of those variability. And so I think thermal, thermal effects will continue to be a challenge here. And obviously, as you get higher density, the thermal effects become more difficult to manage. And as that's in three dimensions, it becomes more difficult to get that heat out of the inside. We're also used to think about DRAM as something that will be there forever. It's never going to die. But the reality is, as you start increasing the density, you start having thermal effects that affect things like aging and electromigration that you didn't have before, right? Um, all of these effects are, are, are difficult to manage. I would say some form of dynamic random access memory will live on forever. Whether it's going to look exactly the same as what we're building today, um, it's anybody's guess right now. That transition is going to be very, very interesting into a more uh, 3D environment. There have been a lot of people making some, uh, taking some guesses and making some analyses about what that structure will look like in the future, uh, but some form of um, a volatile memory like DRAM, dynamic memory, will exist long term because systems have been built around um, that capability in the architecture. David Freed, as always, thanks for a great explanation. I appreciate it. Thanks for spending the time, Ed.